In the final years of the 20th century, amid the dot-com frenzy and millennial hype, a quiet revolution was underway. A new operating system, born as a hobby in a Helsinki bedroom, was exploding onto the world stage. Its name was Linux. Seemingly overnight, this renegade software leapt from an idea shared by one student to a global phenomenon, infiltrating corporate strongholds and attracting millions of devoted users on every continent. By the dawn of the 21st century, Linux powered web servers across the internet and even orbiting NASA machines. It wasn't just an underdog technology, it was the vanguard of a new way of creating software, a collaborative open model that challenged how technology itself would be built. Today, the impact is everywhere. The Android phone in your pocket runs a kernel that traces directly back to Linux. Nearly all of the world's top supercomputers and a majority of servers rely on it. To understand how Linux began, we must go back to the early 1980s, when Richard Stallman sparked the free software movement. A decade later, those ideals set the stage for a student in Finland to write a kernel that would change the world. Our story begins in the hallowed halls of MIT's Artificial Intelligence Laboratory in 1980. In a cluttered printer room, Richard Stallman, a young software programmer with intense eyes and a halo of curly hair, stands frowning at a brand new laser printer. It has jammed again. Normally, Stallman would simply fix the problem by tweaking the printer's code. He's done it before with the old machines, but this time is different. When he searches for the software's source code to implement a fix, he comes up empty. The code is locked away, proprietary. Stallman tracks down the researcher who has the code and asks for a copy. The reply is a polite but firm no. The code was provided under a non-disclosure agreement and he had promised not to share it. Solman resolved to never feel so helpless with his own computer again. He envisioned an operating system that anyone could study, improve and share, just like the communal spirit that had thrived in the lab's hacker culture of the 1970s. In 1983, he announced a bold plan on an internet news group. He would create a complete Unix-compatible operating system and give it away free to everyone. He called it GNU, a recursive acronym for GNU's Not Unix, blending hacker humor with a defiant message. Starting this Thanksgiving, I am going to write a complete Unix-compatible software system called GNU and give it away free to everyone who can use it. By the late 1980s, the GNU project had built most of a complete operating system, tools like the GCC compiler and Emacs editor. But one critical piece was missing, the kernel. Stallman's team had started work on GNU Herd, but progress was slow. The kernel never reached a usable state. Little did anyone know, the missing piece would soon arrive from an unexpected source, not from MIT or any tech powerhouse, but from a modest university student, hacking away in a far-off corner of the world. Helsinki, Finland, summer 1991. A 21-year-old computer science student named Linus Torvalds sits hunched over his PC in a small apartment. Linus is shy, curious and utterly absorbed in a personal project. He's trying to write his own operating system kernel, just for fun. What led him here was a mix of curiosity and constraint. Linus had been enamored with the Unix operating system, ever since reading Andrew Tannenbaum's book, Operating Systems Design and Implementation. He wanted to run Unix on his home computer, but the only option, Minix, was limited. It was designed for education and had strict limitations set by Tannenbaum, who kept it minimalist and wasn't keen on outside improvements. Frustrated by those constraints and eager to explore the full power of his new Intel 386 chip, Linus did what any restless hacker might. He decided to create something better himself. Through the warm weeks of 1991, Linus hacked away in isolation, writing code to control the CPU, memory and disk, the core of a new kernel. He had no grand plan for world domination. He wasn't thinking of changing computing or fulfilling Stallman's dream. He later admitted, he started the project to learn about the 386 processor and to have a Unix-like system he could run at home. It was, at the outset, a personal challenge, a geeky adventure. By late August, Linus's kernel was starting to work. It could run some basic GNU programs he'd ported the Bash shell and GCC compiler, and it didn't crash immediately. It was primitive, but functional. At this point, many a hacker might keep tinkering in private. Instead, Linus made a decision that would alter the course of software history he reached out to the world for feedback. On August 25, 1991, users of the Usenet group CompOS Minix, the online hangout for Minix enthusiasts, saw a new post pop up with an intriguing subject line. What would you like to see most in Minix? Inside, the message was unassuming and a bit self-deprecating. Hello, everybody out there using Minix. I'm doing a free operating system, just a hobby. 
won't be big and professional like GNU. He explained that his project had been brewing since April and was coming together. I'd like any feedback on things people like or dislike in Minix, as my OS resembles it somewhat, he continued before cautioning, but I won't promise I'll implement them. He signed off simply, as if this were no big deal, just another student project announcement. In a postscript, he added one more line, almost as an afterthought. P.S. Yes, it's free of any Minix code and it has a multi-threaded file system. It is not portable, uses 386 task switching, etc. And it probably never will support anything other than at hard disks, as that's all I have. It was an honest disclaimer of the project's humble scope and his own hardware limits. In short, Linus was saying, I've made this thing, it works, kind of. I plan to release it for free, but don't expect too much. True to his word, Linus released the first version of his kernel, version 0.01, in mid-September 1991. He uploaded the source code to an FTP server for those early testers. It wasn't even announced on the wider internet at first. Linus just told the dozen or so people who'd contacted him that they could now download Linux 0.01. The name Linux itself was an accident of fate. Linus had whimsically called his project FreeAx, a mashup of free, free, and the requisite Unix X. But the FTP admin, Ari Lemke, thought freaks was silly and labeled the directory pub slash OS slash Linux instead. The name stuck. Much to Linus's later surprise and mild embarrassment, the code was rough, but it worked. It wasn't pretty, Linus admitted, but it wasn't too embarrassing to show to others. With that quiet release, he opened the door for a world of co-developers to shape what came next. Once that threshold was crossed, there was no going back. And today, that same spirit of collaboration continues, especially in the age of AI. Here's a quick word about a tool that's helping modern developers navigate that complexity. These days, AI tools are everywhere, and buying them individually, it adds up fast. That's where chat llm.abacus.ai comes in. A unified platform where all the leading language models are available in one place. You get access to ChatGPT 5, Claude Sonnet 4.1, Gemini 2.5 Pro, Brock 4, DeepSeek, Perplexity, and others, with Root LLM smartly choosing the best model for each prompt. It's not just text generation. You can create images using Flux, Ideogram, Recraft, or ChatGPT's image model, and generate videos with tools like Kling, Runway, and Haloo, all from simple prompts. There's a humanized feature that rewrites AI text to sound more natural and bypass detectors. You can even create full presentations, research reports, or build complete websites and apps using DeepAgent. And for coders, it includes Code LLM, an AI coding editor built right in. All this for just $10 a month. Visit chatllm.abacus.ai or click the link in the description to explore it. Now back to the story of Linux. Throughout late 1991 and 1992, Linux evolved at a breakneck pace. Contributions started trickling, then flooding in bug fixes, device drivers, patches to add features. The process was organic and chaotic. Linux issued updates frequently, often several in a single week, incorporating whatever patches people sent that made sense. It was a style of development that would later be dubbed release early, release often, and it became a cornerstone of the open source approach. Linus also proved to be a pragmatic and easygoing leader. Linus trusted contributors to take charge. His approach, open, fast and decentralized, seemed chaotic, but it worked. Linux improved rapidly with each release. By early 1992, Linux was gaining attention as a fast, free kernel when combined with the user tools and utilities from the GNU project, like the compiler, shell, and libraries, it became a fully working operating system. Stallman's GNU had spent years building everything except the kernel, the part that talks directly to the hardware. Linux, meanwhile, had written just that missing piece. His Linux kernel filled the gap GNU hadn't yet completed. The result was something neither could achieve alone, a fully free, Unix-like OS, built by two different people, chasing different goals, that happened to align at just the right time. But not everyone was impressed. In January 1992, a fiery debate erupted between Linus and his own inspiration, Professor Andrew Tannenbaum. Tannenbaum criticized Linux for its monolithic kernel, calling it a giant step back into the 1970s. Linus, fiercely protective, shot back that Minix was brain damaged. The debate drew even more attention to the project. Realizing his initial restrictive license was holding back collaboration, Linus made another pivotal decision. He switched Linux to Richard Stallman's GNU General Public License, or GPL. This ensured Linux would always remain free and, crucially, made it legally compatible with the vast library of GNU tools. The body finally had its heart. With the kernel stabilized, the community faced a new challenge, making it usable. This sparked the desktop wars. 
One group of developers created KDE, a powerful and polished graphical desktop, but it was built on a programming toolkit, QT, whose license wasn't considered fully free by Stallman and the GNU project. In response, the GNU project initiated its own effort, GNOME. It was a direct reflection of Stallman's uncompromising idealism, a desktop built with a purely free software stack. This rivalry between the pragmatic KDE and the idealistic GNOME was intense, and it drove years of incredible innovation in the quest to make Linux user-friendly. All of this chaotic, decentralized progress was finally given a name by hacker philosopher Eric S. Raymond. In his 1997 essay, The Cathedral and the Bazaar, he contrasted traditional, top-down software development, The Cathedral, with Linux's open, peer-to-peer -peer model, The Bazaar. He coined Linux's law, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. As the decade closed, this bazaar was about to become big business. A company called Red Hat had begun packaging Linux into an easy-to-install distribution, but their genius was in their business model. They gave the software away for free and sold support, service, and certification. In 1999, Red Hat's IPO was a massive success on Wall Street. The hobby project had officially hit the big time. The world was taking notice. In 2000, the ultimate validation came. IBM, a titan of the old computing world, announced it would invest $1 billion in Linux. This move signaled to corporations everywhere that Linux was ready for serious, mission-critical work. But as Linux rose, it awakened a giant. Microsoft, the undisputed king of software, saw this free operating system not as a curiosity, but as a threat. Linux is a cancer that attaches itself, in an intellectual property sense, to everything it touches. Microsoft launched a campaign of fear, uncertainty and doubt, or FUD, publishing studies to prove that its own Windows operating system was cheaper and better. But the real threat was yet to come. In 2003, a company called the SCO Group sued IBM for a billion dollars. The claim was explosive. That proprietary Unix code, which SCO claimed to own, had been illegally copied into the Linux kernel. It was an existential threat. If SEO won, Linux could be mired in legal battles for years, or worse, be forced to pay royalties on every copy. The lawsuit was a battle for the very soul of open source. The entire community rallied, and after years of brutal legal warfare, the court sided with IBM and the Linux community. The project was safe. Out of this crucible of conflict, a new vision emerged. In 2004, a South African tech entrepreneur named Mark Shuttleworth founded Canonical. His goal was to create a version of Linux that directly answered the FUD. He called it Ubuntu, an African word meaning humanity to others. Its slogan was Linux for human beings, and it was focused on one thing, making Linux easy to install and use for everyone. Having survived corporate attacks and legal battles, the Linux project needed to mature. In 2007, the Linux Foundation was formed. A neutral nonprofit, it took on the role of stewarding the project, hosting its infrastructure, and employing Linus Torvalds and other key developers like Greg Crow-Hartman, who maintains the stable kernel today. It was the professionalization of the revolution. The foundation's members include the biggest names in technology, Google, Oracle, Intel, Amazon, and in a final stunning irony, one of its top contributors today is Microsoft. The old enemy had joined the revolution. While the year of the Linux desktop never quite came to pass in the way the community had hoped, Linux won in a much bigger way it became the invisible backbone of the digital world. It runs the servers for Google, Facebook, and Amazon. It powers nearly all of the world's 500 fastest supercomputers. It's in your smart TV, your car, and the New York Stock Exchange. And through Android, it's in the pockets of billions of people. The revolution didn't happen by overthrowing the king. It happened by building the foundation for a new world right under his feet. It's a story that proves that passionate people sharing code across borders can change the world, not by planning a revolution, but by accidentally starting one in a Helsinki dorm room.